This is uh, Farrokh Nadim, also from NGI, and I'm sitting here together with Finn. And this is a uh, presentation, hopefully it's not going to take too long, because I know we're already a little bit over time and um, everybody's getting kind of losing their attention and getting tired. Uh, but I would just like to acknowledge the contribution of many co-authors and colleagues, both here at NGI and other places in, around the world who've contributed to this work that we did for you and ISDR. Um, the term last slide refers to a variety of processes that could uh, be from a very small rockfall to a kind of a mobilization of a huge volume of masses of several million cubic meters. Uh, but uh, individual landslides usually do not cause spectacular disasters like, like you have in tsunamis and earthquakes. But in uh, terms of frequency, landslides events are by, by far the most frequent geohazard. And if you um, add and look at the accumulated consequences of landslides, then uh, they're comparable to the type of um, damage that you get from floods and earthquakes. They represent a major threat to human life, to properties, buildings, infrastructure, cultural heritage, natural environment, and so on. I will come back to that point a little bit later on. Think about the triggering factors for landslides. Um, extreme precipitation and generally um, large amounts of water, that's by far the biggest triggering factor for landslides. Maybe 70 to 80 percent of all the natural landslides are caused by heavy precipitation. Following that is the strong earthquake. If you have a big earthquake in a hilly and mountainous region, then landslides are going to happen. There's a picture there from the um, El Salvador earthquake in January 2001, the Las Colinas event, and that event uh, caused 600 fatalities. The earthquake in total caused 900 fatalities, so two-thirds of the total sum was caused by that single event. Uh, again, if we think about the Wenchuan earthquake in 2008 uh, in, in China, about uh, 25 to 40 percent is estimated of the fatalities were caused by landslides, and that amounts to about 20 to 30,000 fatalities. But uh, when people think about the Wenchuan earthquake or think about this El Salvador earthquake, very few people think about landslides because usually in the natural disaster databases, these events are registered by the first event, so they're registered as earthquakes. Uh, another major cause for triggering of landslides is human activity. And um, uh, very little research has been done on this factor, but it uh, turns out that um, there's no limit to how many stupid things we can do as humans <laughs> in triggering of landslides. Um, it's when one is working with landslide hazard and risk, it's important to remember its um, correlation with other types of natural hazards. As I just mentioned, earthquakes and extreme precipitation are major triggers of landslides, but landslides in turn can lead to other types of hazards. For example, a big rock slide into a lake or a reservoir may cause an impact wave or kind of a mini tsunami. And uh, there are many events where a landslide blocks a river and then it uh, creates kind of a landslide dam and, and there's a, a, a lake that's created behind it and sooner or later that dam is going to break and cause flooding downstream. And, it's a very important feature to remember, if, especially if one is concerned about cascading events and, and these multi-hazards. Uh, this picture shows some of the vulnerable categories that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, in terms of economic consequence, uh, especially the extended networks of linear structures, like road networks, railway networks, lifelines, they're particularly vulnerable to landslides. And in many countries, even though these type of landslides do not cause too many fatalities, they do have severe economic consequences. Uh, for those of us who work with landslide risk, one of the major challenges is that it's, it's not a static um, entity to, to evaluate. It's continuously changing and evolving. As I mentioned earlier, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the landslides are created, are triggered by uh, hydrometeorological events. 
Uh, this figure here shows the results of a study that was done in the large um, European landslide risk assessment uh, project called SAFETAN. The figure on the top left-hand side shows our assessment of the present-day landslide hazard in Europe. Then uh, what you see in the remaining figures is that how, how that hazard is going to change, increase or decrease in, in, the, in the coming century, or in the present century actually, <laughs> not in the coming century, but until 2090. And the reason for this change is both climate change and changes in the land use. Now on top of that, there's also uh, major changes in the population density in Europe. There's um, uh, many parts of Europe are experiencing a reduction in population. There's a large uh, trend towards urbanization and that's global and there's also uh, immigration from east to west. Maybe that's kind of slowed down. But all these things means that the population at risk of the exposed population is also going to go under dramatic change in, the, in this uh, next hundred years or so. So combined with the changes in hazard, that means that we have, we have a very dynamic risk picture. And, and to, in order to mitigate this, this risk, we have to be very proactive and, and, and think about not just what's happening now, but how the situation is going to be the next 30 to, to 50 years. So what strategies do we have for mitigating the landslide risk? Well, we could think about uh, engineering solutions, physical measures like slope stabilization, improving the drainage, erosion protection, vegetation, ground improvements, and so on. But just as important or just as effective are these non-structural measures. In, in many cases, early warning systems can be very effective. Land use planning is very effective because we, as uh, scientists, we can identify which areas are most exposed to landslide risk and then try to avoid putting um, new buildings, new infrastructure there. Like every other risk, public awareness is extremely ex uh, important, preparedness, uh, and uh, not the least, uh, enforcement of building codes and good construction practice. Even though in many countries these uh, land use plans and building codes exist, um, it's not often that they're enforced in practice. And finally, measures to pool and transfer the risk, insurance and reinsurance, that's also um, uh, an important tool for dealing with the landslide risk. Finally, I just want to bring up this poverty dimension. Uh, landslide, it's not a disaster in itself. It's, it's a natural geological process. It's basically Earth doesn't like gravity, doesn't like slopes. Earth wants to be flat. Uh, so landslides happen all the time. There's nothing we can do to prevent them. But uh, as one goes through this data, one finds that in developed countries, it's quite rare that a landslide event turns into a disaster. Uh, the countries that are most exposed to landslide risk, they're located along the Himalayan belt in South and Southeast Asia and in Central and South America. And often these disasters are uh, due to a lack of resources in, uh, that result in poor planning or um, lack of enforcement of legis legislation and regulations and so on. So I guess this is, is becoming a cliche now. Uh, there's no such thing as a natural disaster because disasters are not natural. They're results of how we build up our society. And uh, to effectively deal with the landslide risk, we, could, uh, we can only think about measures at a very local level. For, for example, introducing early warning systems could be quite effective in, in many areas. And finally, um, faced with natural hazards, our only resource is to learn to live with them. And one can live with a hazard provided that the risk is reduced to a tolerable level. So we have to shift our focus from a response re recovery mode of thinking towards prevention and mitigation, building resilience and increasing the coping capacity, and learning from experience to avoid the past mistakes. And I thank you for your attention.